I know that it is Beatles Sunday here at Myers Park Baptist Church, and that we are basking in the genius of Lennon and Harrison and McCartney. But on this Labor Day weekend, I've also been thinking about the words of another great poet from my parents' generation, Billy Joel, <laughs> who sang these words. Well, we're living here in Allentown, and they're closing all the factories down. Out in Bethlehem, they're killing time, filling out forms, standing in line. Our fathers fought the Second World War, spent their weekends on the Jersey Shore, met our mothers at the USO, asked them to dance, dance with them slow. And we're living here in Allentown. But the restlessness was handed down and it's getting very hard to stay. Well, we're waiting here in Allentown for the Pennsylvania we never found, for the promises our teachers gave if we worked hard, if we behaved. So the graduations hang on the wall, but they never really helped us at all. No, they never taught us what was real, iron and coal, chromium steel. And we're waiting here in Allentown, but they've taken all the coal from the ground, and the Union people crawled away. And back then, the bridge says every child had a pretty good far as their old man got. But something happened on the way to that place. They threw an American flag in our face. Billy Joel's 1982 Nylon Curtain album included many references to the disillusionment of the American dream, but none so poignant as Allentown which became an anthem for blue-collar America, representing the aspirations and the frustrations of the American working class in the late 20th century. The subject of the song is the demise of the manufacturing industry. When Bethlehem Steel, one of the largest companies in the world, closed, a generation of people were left jobless and depressed, wanting to leave town but still clinging to the glory that their parents had achieved. And ironically, just as Billy Joel released this song, my parents moved to Bethlehem with a wide-eyed and precocious toddler looking to find their piece of the American dream. My mother taught at Lehigh University, and my father, a foundryman and pattern maker, opened a machine shop in Easton, Pennsylvania. They both worked insanely hard, and. While they worked, I went to school with the kids whose parents had lost their jobs at the steel factory and were struggling to provide for their families and rebuild their lives. Growing up in Bethlehem in the 1980s would have been enough to open up my mind about the precarity of the American dream, but when I was 17, my mom accepted a teaching position here at UNC Charlotte, and we moved, of all places, to Kannapolis, North Carolina. As far as small towns go, there are a lot of things that Bethlehem and Kannapolis have in common, but one that I was not expecting was for the largest employer to shut down in my hometown again and lay off its entire workforce. When Fieldcrest Cannon closed, the Washington Post reported the town of Kannapolis unraveled. It was a very difficult time, and I witnessed the devastation firsthand, going to school and playing with sports with the kids whose parents had lost their jobs at the local mill. Many proud, skilled, third and fourth generation mill workers were now forced to apply for jobs at Walmart. We live today in a divided America, where people can't seem to agree on anything at all. But one of the few things almost every person in our society, at least the majority, have in common, regardless of race, gender, sexual orientation, or religious affiliation, is that they are workers. We are workers. With the exception of children who are often future workers and retired Americans who are former workers for the most part, and people who cannot work and need our support, everyone else is a worker. Even if we're providing caregiving for children or adults at home, especially if it's unpaid 
we are still most definitely workers, laborers. And there was a time in American history when workers and the work that they did were treated with a sense of dignity and respect. But sadly, that has changed. I find it fascinating that the, the very same year that Billy Joel released this song about the closing of Bethlehem Steel, Pope John Paul II issued an encyclical called Laborum Exercens on human work, which begins with the famous line, through work, humanity must earn their daily bread. It is in this extraordinary document that the Pope developed the argument that work is more than just a human activity or commodity, but an essential aspect of the nature of God and an integral part of what it means to be a human being made in God's image. God worked, the Pope said, for six days to bring all of creation into existence, created human beings in their likeness as workers and as fellow co-creators, and then on the seventh day rested from their labors. And so there is something both indelibly human and intrinsically divine about work. And the Pope, the Pope then connected both work and rest and contended that they are a sharing in the activity of the Creator, following in the footsteps of Jesus the carpenter and Paul the tent maker. He went on to claim that there are many factors in the modern world that have degraded the dignity of work and argued that labor should take precedence over capital. Because people, he said, are more important than property. That's right, the Pope said that. He also asserted that the church, Christian people, followers of Jesus, should offer our full and unwavering support for the rights of workers, specifically advocating for living wages, unions, the dignity of agricultural work, rights of disabled persons, and immigration. The Pope grounded all of this in an understanding that work is essentially a spiritual activity. And I know it must seem strange to hear a Baptist minister discuss a papal encyclical in worship on Sunday, but my guess is it might be even more odd to hear the idea that work is a spiritual activity. I fear today that many of us have lost our sense of the spirituality of our work and no longer think about the labor we engage in as a, a holy endeavor. Even those of us, like myself, who serve as spiritual guides for religious institutions can still forget that all of our labor is a spiritual activity. How did we lose sight of the spirituality of work? One argument scholars have made is that during the Industrial Revolution, men left the farm and began working outside the home for the very first time. And because of this new thing, a, a new ideology developed, a new gender ideology called separate spheres. Others may have heard of it called the cult of true womanhood or domesticity. And it was a set of social standards placed primarily on women in the late 19th century that understood there to be two spheres or realms in the world. There's the public world and then there's the private realm. The public realm is the, the dirty and immoral and competitive arena of work and politics and the private realm was the pure and clean and pious and moral place of the home and the church. In this ideology, men were to be engaged out in the public realm of work and politics, but there was bad and difficult and heavy stuff going on out there, and so what men needed was a respite from all of that. So women were given the burden of providing a refuge for men from the dirty realm of work and politics by creating safe spaces for them at home and at church. The problems this ideology created for women are obvious. And thankfully, it led them to fight for radical change. But the basic compartmentalization of public and private spheres still haunts us today. Work and politics remain separated in our minds from home and church, and the church has been domesticated into the privatized realm of personal spirituality. There's nothing wrong with home and church being a refuge from the harsh, industrialized world, but not if it's only a refuge for men. Or if being a refuge means certain topics cannot be discussed. 
A refuge is a space where people are welcomed and loved and cared for and accepted, but it's also a space where we tell each other the truth and discuss the difficult parts of our everyday lives. Otherwise, our safe refuge becomes nothing more than a facade for silence and oppression. The first century world of Jesus and the gospel writers did not have separate spheres, but we still do. And it has had a massive impact on the way we read the Bible and understand the teachings of Jesus, how we worship, even how we pray. In fact, the meaning of the Lord's Prayer from our text today, the most famous and often recited prayer in Western history, has been obscured by this dualism, by this anemic individualist spirituality that is a hangover from those separate spheres. Many Christians can recite the Lord's Prayer from memory. And this familiarity means that the prayer can provide us great comfort in times of trouble. And yet it has also caused this prayer to become somewhat rote, irrelevant, and meaningless for our everyday lives, separated into a sphere of personal piety and devotion, abstracted from the real world of work and politics. Jesus offered this prayer to his disciples who said, Lord, teach us to pray. But we often forget that the, the disciples were first and foremost workers before they were disciples. Fishermen, tax collectors, day laborers, shepherds, and sex workers. In response to their requests, Jesus not only provided them a model of how to pray and what to pray for, but a prayer for workers and for a, a kingdom, a kingdom economy that worked for all people. It was a prayer for the year of Jubilee, which Jesus stated as his mission in Luke 4 to bring good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and freedom from oppression. It was a call for the provisions back in Leviticus 25, the feeding of the hungry from the fallow fields, forgiveness of debts, the redistribution of property and wealth back to its original owner. It was a prayer for the birth of a completely new form of economic relationships between all people in society. Give us each day our daily bread. It seems like a simple request for daily nourishment. But the word here translated as daily was the same as the Latin word which referred to the daily rations that Romans issued to slaves and soldiers and workers. Most people in the first century were not paid with currency but with rations a measured out allowance of food per day. They were literally paid in bread. Bread was their wages, which is why we still have these wonderful phrases like breadwinner in our society today. When Jesus taught his disciples to pray, give us each day our daily bread, he was really saying, give us each day our daily wages which significantly expands the economic significance of the prayer because it means Jesus was concerned not only that workers should be paid fair wages, but that if workers were not being paid fair wages, they should pray for it. And that the disciples should demand it. Because prayer is not just something that we do with our minds and our mouths, but with our hands and our feet as well. I recently heard the story of a coal miner named Braxton Wright, who works at the Warrior Met Coal Mine in Brookwood, Alabama. Five years ago, he and other workers were promised that if they worked more hours with less pay and less staff and less time off, that when the time came for their next contract, that the coal company would make it up to them and compensate them for their years of sacrifice. But when negotiations came in 2020, the Warrior Met Coal Company said they never made that promise to the workers and refused to pay the miners even after they'd worked shorthanded through COVID as essential workers in one of the most deadliest jobs in America. So on April 1st of this year, Braxton and the other miners started one of the longest strikes in recent memory. 
And when he was interviewed by the New York Times, Braxton described his deep frustrations with the American political system, saying that he felt dismissed by Democrats, betrayed by Republicans, and abandoned by everyone in both political parties in their struggle for dignity and respect as they fight to receive their daily bread. What about the church? What is our relationship and responsibility to the average worker? Are we to support their struggle for dignity and respect, for their right to receive their daily bread? When we pray the Lord's Prayer, do we pray for workers in America and around the world to receive fair wages and to be treated with dignity? Despite Jesus' teachings and the Pope's encyclical, throughout American history, churches and church leaders have found themselves heavily on the side of owners instead of workers, taking sides in this fight. In Mill Hands and Preachers, Liston Pope tells the story of nearby Gastonia, where pastors align themselves with textile mills against the livelihood of the workers in their pews. And even more close to home for us, we must confess, the book Struggle for the Soul of the Post-War South shows how our first senior minister, Dr. George Heaton, worked diligently on behalf of industry owners to break up unions and called for overthrowing the fetish of collective bargaining, which he thought to be fundamentally divisive and unchristian. However, America's changed dramatically since 1944. And I believe that Dr. Heaton could not have imagined a 40-year period of wage stagnation, where productivity would increase by 74% and worker compensation only by nine. He could not have possibly anticipated the way neoliberalism has transformed American industry, limiting the rights and dignities of workers. He could never have envisioned a world where CEOs, the average CEO makes 300 times more than the average worker. And so I believe fundamentally that if Dr. Heaton were alive today, he would stand also on the side of the worker against policies that refuse to increase the minimum wage or erode collective bargaining or decimate union membership. Unlike the post-war period of 1944, the average worker today receives less daily bread than the generations who came before them. And this has led people of faith and good conscience now to believe that raising wages is the central moral imperative of our age. But there's another spiritual task that is equally important. As a young Methodist, I remember being raised to pray each Sunday for the forgiveness of my trespasses. Some of you may have been taught to pray for the forgiveness of your sins or possibly debts if you happen to be raised Presbyterian. I came to, to realize rather curiously that the word trespasses does not appear anywhere in the Gospels. In Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And in Luke, it says, forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors. Debts was always the primary word here. And yet, interestingly, we seem to interpret it on solely individual and non-economic basis, a spiritual debt. Forgiveness, we know, is one of the most important spiritual concepts. And we know that beloved community is impossible without it. But our relationships also have an economic dimension. And Jesus was telling his disciples that no one should live in a relationship of debt to another person. It creates a hierarchy of power, a dynamic of master and servant that is ripe for domination and oppression. Instead, he said, when we pray, we should ask for the forgiveness of all of our debts, financial or otherwise, and grant forgiveness to anyone who is indebted to us. I know you're not going to find this advice on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. But the recent discussion about student loan forgiveness has elevated the issue of debt to the surface of our social conversation again. Our debts and our daily bread are connected. The lack of fair wages over the last 40 years has plunged millions of Americans into crisis. In many cases, even an increase of wages at this point won't make up for the mounting debt so many Americans are carrying. And the negative reaction that we all saw to the loosening, the slight loosening 
of the millstone around the necks of millions of people stems from an ancient belief that is almost as old as civilization itself. And it's the belief that all debt is sin, and all sin is debt, and therefore must be repaid. A few years ago, I discovered the work of a British economist named Michael Hudson, and I was stunned to learn that in most ancient societies, sin and debt are the exact same word. Which means that for most cultures in history, sin and debt are the same thing. Debt was sin. Sin was debt. One was not moral and the other financial. They were always both, which is why it was so radical that in the first century, Jesus came and said he, he was here to forgive sins and cancel debts, to free us all from both. No wonder the Pharisees said, who are you to forgive people's sins? What authority do you have to do this? Jesus did not believe, as so many in our society do today, that debt was sacred. He believed that people were sacred. He did not believe in the sanctity of debt, but in the sanctity of workers and their lives. He came to free us all from the chains of an economic way of life that creates a society of haves and have-nots instead of a beloved community of love and equality and peace. When we pray, give, our, give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts, we are praying for a world where no one goes hungry. And no one is enslaved by financial burdens. When we pray, give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts, we are praying for a world where everyone receives fair wages and where everyone gets a second chance for freedom. When we pray, give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts, we are paying for workers' rights and for jubilee. When we pray, give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts, we're praying for a, a new economy of abundant life and a material grace for all. When we pray, give us our daily bread and forgive us our debts, we are praying for a world where workers and the work that they do have sacred dignity and respect. Today is Labor Sunday, a day to elevate workers, to celebrate their contributions to our society, to support their struggles for freedom from all indignities and inhumanities, large and small, that cripple their spirit and hinder their journey toward greater wholeness and joy. And it's also a day for us as the church and the followers of Jesus, to recommit ourselves to the fight for fair wages and freedom from the crushing weight of mounting debt, and to do so faithfully in the name of Jesus. If we do this, then as the, Pob the poet Pablo Neruda once wrote, life itself will have the shape of bread, deep and simple, immeasurable and pure. Every living thing will have its share of soil and life and the bread we eat each morning, everyone's daily bread, will be hollow and sacred because it will have been won by the longest and costliest of human struggles. So let us pray with mind and mouth, hands and feet, our creator who is in the universe, sacred is your name. Your beloved community come, your will be done on earth as it is in the universe. Give us each day our daily wages and forgive us our debts as we forgive those indebted to us, financial or otherwise. Save us all from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, now and forever. Amen.